Estas. <clears throat> Our scripture reading comes from Romans chapter 4. And we'll also look at Lord's Day 23 of the Heidelberg Catechism, found on page 224 of the Forms and Prayers, 224. So Romans chapter 4 and Lord's Day 23. Romans chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Hear now the word of the Lord. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he is something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. <clears throat> is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had, before he was circumcised. May God bless the reading of his word to us. <clears throat> and now let's look at Lord's Day 23. I will read the question. Let us respond together with the answer. So question 59, but how does it help you now that you believe all this? Answer, that I am righteous in Christ before God and heir to life everlasting. Question 60, how are you righteous before God? Answer, only by true faith in Jesus Christ, even though my conscience accuses me of having grievously sinned against all God's commandments, of never having kept any of them, and of still being inclined toward all evil. Nevertheless, without any merit of my own, out of sheer grace, God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ, as if I had never sinned nor been a sinner, and as if I had been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me, if only I accept this gift with a believing heart. Question 61, why do you say that through faith alone you are righteous? Answer, not because I please God by the worthiness of my faith, for only Christ's satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness are my righteousness before God. And I can receive this righteousness and make it mine in no other way than by faith alone. So we're on Lord's Day 23. We took a break from the catechism the last couple weeks. Pick up today with the very end of the Apostles' Creed section that comes at the end of Lord's Day 22. And so now question 59 basically answers the so what of the Apostles' Creed section. What, what does all this do? What, what is the benefit of this? How does it help me? And this Lord's Day deals primarily with the doctrine of justification. Zacharias Ursinus, the primary author of the Heidelberg Catechism, said that justification is a fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith. So in other words, if you get this doctrine wrong, it affects how you see the entirety of the Christian faith. 
Justification is so crucial, says Ursinus, that it's one of the two primary areas in which Orthodox Christians and heretics have battled. He says the real battleground is the doctrine of God and the doctrine of justification. So question 59 tells us that if we believe all this in the creed, all of this truth, that we are righteous before God and heir to life everlasting. Well, first of all, what is righteousness? If we're going to be righteous before God, we must know what righteousness is. The simple answer is conformity to God's law. If someone conforms to God's law, that person is righteous. If someone does not conform to God's law, that person is sinful. Sin, of course, transgression of God's law or lack of conformity to God's law. So righteousness is conformity to God's law. Second, God is the standard of righteousness. His perfect character determines what is righteous. There's lots of talk in our culture today about righteousness and justice. Every time you turn on the TV, someone says there's injustice happening. But what's the standard? What's the standard against which we measure all things? And from where do we get that standard? How do we know? Who gets to decide what is the standard? The standard of righteousness must be a transcendent, perfectly holy God. It can't be anything but. It can't be a mere human being, because every human being is sinful. And even if we try to propose a non-human standard, like an idea of righteousness, the Greeks had this, this idea of virtue, non-human, this kind of ethereal idea. Even if we try to propose something like that, our evaluation of that non-human standard is itself tainted by sin. So how can we determine what this external standard is because we are corrupted by sin? How do we know that this external standard is righteous? Humans cannot be the standard, and humans cannot choose the standard of righteousness. It has to be revealed to us. It has to come from without that's why God comes to us and he shows us that the standard is himself. So righteousness is conformity to God's law. God himself is the standard. And now we distinguish between legal and evangelical righteousness. Legal and evangelical righteousness. Legal righteousness is the fulfilling of the law by an individual. So an individual fulfills the law, and then on the basis of that fulfillment, he is declared righteousness. He's declared righteous. Someone perfectly obeys the law, then based on that obedience, he's declared legally righteous. Well, who would qualify as legally righteous? Well, Adam, before the fall, was legally righteous righteous. Up until the point where he sins, he is righteous before God. He had obeyed God's law, and so legally, he was righteous. Of course, that did not continue. Christ, in his incarnation, is legally righteous. In his human nature, he perfectly fulfills God's law, and he is declared righteous based on that fulfillment. So there's legal righteousness. Then there's evangelical righteousness. This involves the fulfilling of the law by another in our place. The fulfilling of the law by another in our place. That righteousness then is imputed to us by God through faith. 
So legal righteousness is earned righteousness. Someone is perfectly obedient to God's law and declared righteous based on that obedience. We can never get there. Therefore, we need evangelical righteousness, a gift of grace, imputed righteousness. So the righteousness that Christ earned for us, that legal righteousness that he earned, then is granted to us by grace. So we must distinguish between those two types of righteousness, legal and evangelical. Now, Luther spoke of alien righteousness. Alien righteousness is not the righteousness of little green men. It is something that is foreign to us, something that, is, that does not belong to us properly. He also spoke of our righteousness as extra nos. Fancy Latin word, two words. Outside of us. It's alien, it's foreign to us, and it's extra nos. It's outside of us. It doesn't arise from within. We don't produce righteousness from within ourselves. It has to come from the outside. And it has to be granted to us. And so the doctrine of justification, then, is the application of the righteousness of Christ. And that's why question 60 says that God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ as if I had never sinned nor been a sinner and as if I had been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me. So let's talk about justification. The doctrine of justification. So first, we can say justification is a forensic judicial decree. A forensic judicial decree. It's forensic because it's a legal matter. It's judicial because it's enacted by a judge, God himself. And it's a decree because it's a declaration. It's a definitive act. It's not a drawn-out process. It's one act of God. And so that's why the Westminster Shorter Catechism distinguishes in its question 33, what is justification? Justification is an act of God's free grace. And then in question 35, what is sanctification? Sanctification is the work of God's free grace. So an act of God is immediate. It happens, it's over, completed. A work of God is, a, is this ongoing process. So we must be very clear, justification is an act of God, it is not a work of God. If you mess that up, the whole thing comes off the rails. So it's a forensic judicial decree, and the ground is Christ alone. The ground is Christ and his work the basis for our justification is Christ's merits alone. His active obedience, his fulfilling of God's law in every way, his passive obedience, his suffering on our behalf, all of that is granted to us and is the basis, the ground of our justification. We don't contribute anything to our justification, not even faith. It is not the ground of our justification. Faith is the instrument. The instrument of justification. Faith alone. Faith, of course, is a gift of God, Ephesians 2. What is faith? The Shorter Catechism again, question 86, what is faith in Jesus Christ? Faith 
in Jesus Christ is a saving grace whereby we receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered to us in the gospel. So faith is a receiving and resting. It's an instrument. It is not something by which we earn righteousness. It is not the ground of our justification. It is the instrument. It's how we receive it. Receiving and resting upon Christ. And then in Heidelberg 61, why do you say that through faith alone you are righteous? Not because I please God by the worthiness of my faith. So faith there is not what grants us righteousness. We're not worthy because of our faith. Only Christ's satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness are my righteousness before God. And I can receive this righteousness and make it mine in no other way than by faith alone. This is how we receive and rest in Christ's righteousness. So just some Old Testament background on justification. Primarily to reveal that it is an act of God. It is not a process of God. Exodus 23, keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not acquit or justify the wicked. So if justification were a process, a work of God, could God justify the wicked? Well, yeah, he could, because they're wicked now, but through a process, they won't remain wicked. So if it were this process, he could say, I justify the wicked, because I'm going to work with them and make them not wicked anymore. But the wicked will not be justified because they can't receive this declaration of righteousness. So it must be an act of God, not a process. If it were a process, there wouldn't be a problem with justifying the wicked. But because it's an act, that's why God says, I cannot acquit the wicked. Then in Deuteronomy 25, if there is a dispute between men and they come into court and the judges decide between them acquitting or justifying the innocent and condemning the guilty... So justifying is contrasted with condemning. It's a judicial act. Condemnation is not a process. You're condemned to death. The gavel is struck. That's it. So too, justification is not a process either. It's a definitive act. And then 1 Kings 8, Solomon prays, If a man sins against his neighbor and is made to take an oath and comes and swears his oath before your altar in this house, then here in heaven and act and judge your servants, condemning the guilty by bringing his conduct on his own head and vindicating the righteous by rewarding him according to his righteousness. Again, similar to the passage in Deuteronomy, prayers offered to God to justify the righteous. This only makes sense if it's a legal declaration. If this is a process, Solomon's prayer makes no sense. So we have to say it is a declarative act of God not a process. Same thing in the New Testament. The Greek word for justify, justification, to justify. Part of the uh, polemic of the Protestant reformers was that this word, uh, to justify, is a forensic legal declaration. It's not a process. It's not a transformative process by which God makes you more and more holy, as Rome says. No, the reformer said, this is a definitive act to be declared righteous. This is a hill they literally died on. They died for the doctrine of justification. So Luke chapter 7, Jesus says, I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. When all the people heard this, and the tax collectors too, they declared God just, same word, having been baptized with the baptism of John. So the people then are recognizing that Jesus' words are true and they're declaring God to be in the right. They're not transforming God into a righteous condition. This is not a process of God becoming righteous. No, the people are acknowledging, recognizing, declaring that God is righteous. Then in Romans 3, verse 19, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth must be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God for the works of the law. No human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So again, a forensic legal term. The world is legally accountable before God. And we also see in Romans 5 this juxtaposition of justification and condemnation. 
The free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. So again, the opposite of justification is condemnation. Adam is condemned in sin. A single act. Justification is the answer to that condemnation. Also a single act, not a process. Well, why do I belabor this? Well, an alternative position is adopted by Roman Catholics. Historically, it's important to be aware that Rome did not have an official doctrine of justification until the Council of Trent in April of 1547. So prior to the Council of Trent, there was a lot of freedom within the doctrine of justification. And there were some Roman Catholic priests and monks and cardinals who believed in something close to justification by grace alone through faith alone. But then at the Council of Trent, that all changes. And now they have a definitive dogma of justification. So in April of 1547, in the sixth session of the Council of Trent, chapter 6, they stated justification is not merely the remission of sins, but also the sanctification and the renewal of the inner man. So they confuse justification, again, this legal declarative act of God, they confuse that with sanctification, which is the work of God. Sanctification is God renovating us, transforming us more and more into the image of Christ. It's a work of God. It's a process. So they confuse these two things. So justification gets confused with sanctification. And that's when things really got cemented for the Roman Catholic Church. Of course, they say the instrument of justification is not faith, it's baptism. Baptism begins this process of grace and cooperation with grace. So then also in session six, in Canon 9, this is where they deliver all the anathemas. So they say, If anyone shall say that by faith alone the impious is justified, so as to mean that nothing else is required in order to cooperate, in order unto the obtaining of the grace of justification, and that it is not in any respect necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the movement of his own will, let him be anathema. So if you believe in justification by faith alone, you are anathema, condemned forever, according to the Roman Catholic Church. And the Reformers said, at this point, Rome has anathematized the gospel. Because that is the gospel. Justification by grace alone through faith alone. When they did this, the hope of the Protestant Reformers for a reformation of the one Christian church in Western Europe was pretty much over. Prior to the Council of Trent, the Reformers had hoped and prayed and labored for the repentance of the Pope and for the reformation of the Catholic Church, that the Pope would recognize the true gospel, that he would repent of his unbiblical authority, they would return to sola scriptura. This was their hope and prayer. This was what all of their work was for. And when they issued this declaration in the Council of Trent, anathematizing the gospel, that's when you start to see the reformers say, it's a synagogue of Satan. Because they have declared the gospel to be condemned. And so there was basically no hope after that for reformation of the church. And that's when Protestantism really begins to be, become a distinctly different idea of Christianity. So that's the Council of Trent. Has anything changed with Rome since then on justification? Many evangelicals will say Rome has become more amenable to justification by grace through faith. The Roman Catholic Catechism from 1994, section 1989 on justification says, the first work of the grace of the Holy Spirit is conversion. 
effecting justification in accordance with Jesus' proclamation at the beginning of the gospel, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Moved by grace, man turns toward God and away from sin, thus accepting forgiveness and righteousness from on high. Justification is not only the remission of sins, but also the sanctification and the renewal of the interior man. Just like Trent. It's a process of turning toward God and away from sin. And that final sentence of the line in the Catechism is a quotation of the Council of Trent. Session 6, Canon 11. If anyone say that men are justified either by the sole imputation of the righteousness of Christ or by the sole remission of sin, to the exclusion of the grace and charity which is shed abroad in their hearts by the Holy Spirit and is inherent in them, or even that the grace by which we are justified is only the favor of God, let him be anathema. So they are looking right at the Council of Trent and bringing that into the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So there is no mistake that the Roman Catholic Church of today upholds the doctrine of justification that was made dogma at the Council of Trent in 1547. They're, they cannot budge on that issue, and they have not, despite what evangelicals would like to believe. So the keys for understanding justification for the Roman Catholic Church is that justification is a process rather than a definitive act. It's not a definitive forensic act. It's a process by which you are made righteous before God. Second, it's not by faith alone, but by faith formed by love. So this is a different understanding of faith. Faith is not a receiving and resting, as we confess. Faith is a movement of the will. So Thomas Aquinas, one of the great theologians of the Roman Catholic Church, says the act of the intellect assenting to a divine truth owing to the movement of the will is faith, which itself moved, is moved by the grace of God. So God gives us grace in baptism. He enables us then to move our will to believe and to act in obedience. So faith is a movement of the will, and you are moving your own will. Now, God gives you the grace to do that, but you are moving your will to believe, and then you act in obedience. So again, it's this confusion of belief and obedience. Number three, says Rome, justification is an infused righteousness, an actual righteousness through our participation in the sacraments and growth in virtues. So we distinguish between imputed righteousness and infused. Infused righteousness comes from within. It comes from within us. Now God gets the ball rolling, but we participate in this process in this process of us becoming righteous. So he starts us off, and then we work with him, cooperating with grace, and we, uh, this, this righteousness uh, arises from within us. And it is actual righteousness. It belongs to us, says Rome. It is within us, arising out of our own cooperation with God's grace. Whereas... The Reformation said, no, it's not our righteousness. It's alien to us. It's extra knows. It's outside of us. It's granted to us, imputed to us. Our righteousness is filthy rags. We need external righteousness. So that is a massive difference. Infused righteousness and imputed righteousness. And then finally for Rome, justification is a lifelong process whose ultimate result is uncertain. There's no assurance in the Roman Catholic Church. You can never be certain of your salvation. And even if you do end up in heaven, it might take thousands, millions of years in purgatory to become purged of your sin. One of the major theologians of the Roman Catholic Church in the period after the Reformation, Cardinal Robert Bellarmine, said that the great heresy of Protestantism is the doctrine of assurance. How dare you think you can be assured of your salvation? So that's Rome, a 
process, not a definitive act, not by faith alone, faith formed by love, an infused righteousness, and an uncertain process. Again, whereas we say and we rest in the fact that justification is a forensic judicial decree. It's legal, a legal declaration of God. God declares us, just as a judge in a courtroom, declares us righteous. So I like to encourage Christians never to say, I feel guilty. Guilt is a legal category. You're not guilty. You've been declared righteous by God himself. How dare you declare yourself guilty? Now, you feel shame when you sin. Of course, we should feel shame. But we should not feel guilt because we are declared righteous in Christ. A forensic judicial decree, the ground is Christ's merits alone, not looking to anyone else but Christ, even our own merit. And the instrument is faith alone, by which we receive and rest in the righteousness that Christ has given to us. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we thank you for your great mercy and grace to us. We thank you for your word that reveals to us that we have no righteousness of our own. We all fall short of your glory. We all have sinned. And we can never produce the righteousness within us that you require. And so we give you great thanks that you have granted us Christ's righteousness that he has earned on our behalf, imputed to us, made it as if we had earned it ourselves. And that based on Christ's work, you have declared us to be righteous, a legal declaration that we have a right standing before you. Give us great comfort and assurance in this doctrine, that it is not only true for others, but also to us, that we stand before you forgiven and righteous in your sight. All of it for the praise of our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. Please rise to receive the Lord's benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship